It is 10 a.m. I am Alex Fisher, and we are just waiting for our local health officials to give us an update on the coronavirus crisis here in Kern County. Moments ago, they added new cases to our total. We've added 291 new cases of coronavirus to our county's total. Now, if that seems low, uh, county officials say there's a reason for that. We have seen several days of lower numbers and the reason why that is is because there is a uh, some technical issues with the reporting data so across the state of california it is not just kern county it is several counties in our state that are seeing lower numbers, if you will, because of this technical issue. So uh, now that being said, that means that once this issue is resolved, we could see a surge in new cases. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what comes from this in the coming days as hopefully this technical issue is worked out. But uh, that is the reason why the 291 cases added today may seem very small. What is not small? The hospitalizations. 266 people are in the hospital right now in a local hospital receiving treatment for coronavirus. Uh, Matt Constantine, the director of our public health department, says that the number of deaths in hospital Hospitalizations, those numbers are accurate because it is not affected by the technical issue that this state is having. That is data that comes in real time. So uh, that gives us a better perspective of how this is, of course, impacting our local health care facilities. So 266 hospitalizations. Uh, some good news. We have learned that there are no new deaths were reported today. So that is definitely a silver lining. Uh, but again, that is another number that can sometimes take time for um, uh, public health officials to give us because it takes time to confirm a death. Let's take you to the news conference from our local uh, health officials. This is Megan Pearson, the public information officer for the county. Uh, let's take a listen in. Before I bring our director of public health up, I'm just going to do a quick update on our, our testing sites uh, to give you some information. We haven't gone through these details in a while, so I am going to reiterate some things. Currently through the county, state, and federal sites, we've conducted 40,457 tests, which makes up about 30% of the testing total. Uh, at our federal surge site alone, uh, we've conducted 2,925 tests. Uh, we've also tested through our mobile farm workers testing program, 76 people. Um, and now for a quick update on the sites. The federal surge site is located at the Kern County Fairgrounds. It's open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We have actually secured an extension on that site. It was set to close this Sunday. So starting Monday, we will start a new 12-day extension of that site. So again, that's seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I want to reiterate that this site is really helpful for those of you who are asymptomatic and still want to get tested. There are some labs that prioritize those um, who are symptomatic or who have been identified through contact tracing and their labs get processed first. Uh, so this is ideal for those of you who may be asymptomatic um, and it, they still are saying that their process and turnaround time is three to five days. You may experience a longer time at another site. The state provided sites remain open and functioning. So you have a site in Arvin at the Old Public Health Building, at the Wasco Library and the Rosamond Library. We encourage you to use those if you're in that area. There are also county provided sites available uh, at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Oildale, the Westside Healthcare District in Taft, the Adventist Health Delano Regional Medical Center in Delano. Uh, Kern River Valley has the Kern Valley Hospital. Tehachapi has Adventist Health Tehachapi Valley. And Lamont is has a site at the Kern County Library. Again, we encourage you to use those if you feel like you need to be tested. They are free. Uh, and all of that information can be found on the county's website, kerncounty.com. There's a large button on the front, and you just click on that. It comes in both English and Spanish. Uh, if you need that, we encourage you to look it up. Now I'll bring up our Director of Public Health, Matt Constantine. Thank you, Megan. Um, this morning we are announcing 291 uh, new cases of COVID-19 in Kern County residents and no additional deaths. Um, we've spoken about the state's database before. It's called CalReady. Um, this database that the state maintains is where all of our lab results go into and then get distributed out by county. 
the state has notified uh, the counties that this database is struggling and has had some uh, issues moving data to the counties. So um, although we're grateful that our numbers that we have been reporting out have been lower, we are concerned that those lower numbers are attributable to the state's um, database not properly working. They've indicated to us that as of last Friday and going forward even as of today, that database is not properly functioning and we would likely expect additional cases that would be attributed to uh, counties and in particular Kern County in the future. They don't know how many and they don't know when it'll be fixed, uh, but um, many of those uh, lab results that are going into the system are not coming out. In fact, we were told that our two largest uh, labs that are used locally, uh, Westpac and Quest, um, are no longer even submitting to CalReady and uh, that presents obviously some concerns to us. So we're awaiting further guidance from the state, uh, but currently uh, that system is not properly working. Um, we've been talking more and more about uh, ICU beds. Um, we had spoken about this previously, but we track this data very closely. Um, many of our uh, metropolitan Bakersfield hospitals, acute care hospitals, are either at or um, above their licensed ICU beds. Uh, Adventist Health Bakersfield is above. Uh, Kern Medical is above their license limit. Uh, Mercy Southwest and Mercy Downtown uh, all exceed their licensed beds. Um, that is a concern, of course, to us. Um, this is what we have been preparing for for some time. Um, Recently, the Board of Supervisors approved a new agreement to allow us to provide more than 80 ICU nurses that are distributed out to our um, large acute care hospitals. Those nurses are now arriving and now being um, assigned to one of these hospitals to help staff up additional ICU beds. And then in addition, um, the state has provided a number of medical teams that are deployed locally to help with um, uh, imminent staffing shortages. So we have several teams in Kern County, um, Kern Medical, Adventist Delano, Adventist Bakersfield, Mercy and Memorial all have state deployed teams that are present uh, today assisting uh, with the um, increased uh, patients at those hospitals. So um, that work continues and we continue to monitor that uh, very closely. And then finally, personal protective equipment always remains of interest to our hospitals. Uh, we put in a large order uh, recently. Um, we are now um, going to distribute 22 pallets of PPE to each of our 10 acute care hospitals. So each hospital has been assigned 22 pallets of personal protective equipment. We're hopeful that that's going to help um, for a long period of time so that they are, they are well equipped and uh, ready to respond. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Lyon, our health officer, so he can provide some comments. Thank you, Matt, and good morning. I just want to speak a little bit more about our efforts together to battle the coronavirus pandemic. It's extremely important for all of us to do our parts to try to stay healthy. So there are certain things that increase our risk for outcomes such as diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking. So it's extremely important to continue taking your medications for your chronic illnesses, as well as to exercise, eat healthy, try to stop smoking, as well as decreasing alcohol intake. We also want to continue to remind you to do your part and stay physically distanced and to wear a mask at all times when you're around other people. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I 
Good morning, uh, everybody. I'm uh, Ryan Alsop, the uh, Chief Administrative Officer for Kern County. Since the beginning of the pandemic, nearly 133,000 people have tested uh, uh, for COVID-19 in our county. And to date, we've had 21,724 residents who've tested positive, 21,306 or about 98% uh, of whom have either fully recovered or are currently isolated and recovering at home, treating their symptoms on their own. Today, we have 266 uh, of our residents uh, representing just over 1% uh, of the total number of positive tests who are receiving some form of care uh, in an area hospital. Fortunately, uh, we have lost 152 people uh, since the beginning of the virus spread in our community. Uh, which represents just under 1% of the total number of those who have tested positive in the county. On hospital beds, we currently are reporting 530 regular hospital beds that are available uh, with, uh, throughout the county with 40 available ICU beds. A little bit on the Kern Recovers program, uh, the uh, Forgivable Loan program to small businesses, a total of $30 million has been pumped into the local economy uh, by the county over the last two months. Uh, not, uh, this, this money has gone to 940 uh, small businesses across 255 industries with an average loan amount of just over uh, $30,000. And uh, we will, uh, that program has uh, um, hit its uh, capacity with the money that has been set aside and we look uh, toward uh, and forward to uh, potentially uh, uh, pumping uh, more money into that program in the weeks and months ahead um, because we believe that it is an important uh, part of dealing with COVID in our community. Uh, the other part of the Kern Recovers program is our personal protective equipment or PPE distribution uh, to, uh, to area small businesses. We have 16 distribution points uh, throughout Kern County. Uh, we are giving small businesses two weeks supply of PPE. Uh, to date, we've had 721 small businesses throughout our county receive this uh, equipment. Uh, this represents businesses across 70 different industries, impacting nearly 12,000 of their employees. Uh, so we're pleased with this program. Uh, this program will continue to be ongoing. Uh, and you can track our progress. You can track who is receiving uh, this personal protective equipment. Small businesses, if you are a small business here in Kern County, you can fill out a simple application and schedule your pickup of these supplies of PPE for your employees by visiting kerncounty.com. Again, uh, we have said this uh, the past couple of weeks, and I'm going to say it again, and I will continue to say it as we um, have these press conferences each week. Uh, one of the most important aspects locally in medical care uh, and treatment uh, at any time, whether it's during a pandemic or not, is blood donation. Uh, it's always important to donate blood, and your, uh, it's important for all of you to know that your donation of your blood uh, at any time saves lives. Uh, during this pandemic, uh, however, the need for convalescent, convalescent plasma uh, donation is critical. Uh, for those of you in our community who have contracted COVID-19 and have recovered, uh, and there are thousands of you, uh, please donate your plasma. Uh, your donation will save lives for those in our community uh, critically impacted by this virus. Uh, these are the people that are in the hospital uh, receiving uh, acute care. These are the people fighting for their lives. Uh, they need your convalescent, uh, convalescent plasma. Uh, this week, Kern County, along with the, uh, the Houchin Blood Bank, has begun an aggressive effort uh, to contact uh, the thousands of you in our community who've tested positive to encourage you uh, to get out and donate your plasma. We need your help again. Uh, you, again, can save uh, the lives of your fellow residents in this community. Please consider donating. Uh, you can do this today by calling Houchin Community Blood Bank's Convalescent Plasma Hotline 
and that number is 661-616-2575. Again, that, air, uh, that number is area code 661-616-2575. Uh, and obviously you can uh, go to Houchin Community Blood Bank's website. You can also go to kerncounty.com uh, to get uh, not only this number, uh, if uh, you weren't able to write it down, but also additional information on how you can go about being a hero in our community and uh, doing us a favor, uh, doing your fellow citizens a favor, and uh, giving your plasma. With that, we're happy to uh, begin the uh, Q&A period. Thank you, Ryan. As always, we'll go in the list that was given to our media outlets. Um, I'm going to say this at the top because we do have one unidentified caller. Um, if uh, I don't want to call out your phone number, um, but there is someone that we don't know which media outlet you're with. Um, so if I miss your outlet and you're on the line, um, we'll come back at the end and make sure we catch everybody. Just like we did last week, we'll ask that each outlet ask their initial question. And if you have, if you need to clarify the response, we're happy to do that. However, if you have follow-ups, we ask that you hold them to the end, uh, so that our outlets who just have one question and have to get to their next story or have an assignment they need to get to, they have the ability to do that. Remember, it's star six to unmute, and we'll start at the top of the list. The first one that we believe we have on the line is channel 17. I think we have Aton. Uh, yes, hi Megan and Ryan. Um, uh, Channel 17, Aton Wallace here, and my my question is uh, as following: you, you you talked about the latest numbers, uh, Ryan and, and and Matt did. Uh, so the positivity rate here in Kern County uh, and Central Valley, many consider uh, are concerning right now. Uh, Dr. Burks uh, at the White House mentioned her, she's concerned about the Central Valley. Are you concerned we're going to see an influx of cases on top of our already uh, high number? So the question, just to clarify, Aitam, what you're asking is whether or not we locally have concern that um, we're going to see an increase on top of what we're already experiencing. Correct. Okay, so we're going to have Matt respond to your question. Give us just one second. Thank you. Hi, Eitan. Um, if the question is whether or not we're going to see an increase in positivity, we have no way to know that at this point. Um, we are. Uh, we know that testing capacity um, in Kern County continues to fluctuate um, and that right now with the current issues we're having with the state database system, we are not getting um, a lot of our lab results in a timely manner. We should uh, mention that this does not affect the reporting that's going back to health care providers and it is not affecting patient care, um, but the disruption is happening between the labs going into the state database system that are coming into the public health department. Um, and so we don't have any way of predicting whether or not testing positivity is going to change. We know that without receiving these electronic labs, um, there's going to be delays in us at the public health department being able to get them onto our dashboard because we're having to enter everything manually. We are indeed focusing on dealing with positive patients um, first, and those negative labs may be um, coming in behind those positive results. And so we want people to be aware that our testing positivity is going to be fluctuating um, based on the manual data entry that's having to go on right now. Typically when those things go in together and we have on any given day all of our positives, all of our negatives come through, um, then we have a pretty accurate picture of the testing positivity. Right now, we, as in probably most other counties in California, are going to spend the, you know, the vast majority of our efforts to make sure our positive test results go into the system, so that their contact investigations, I'm sorry, their case investigations and contact tracing can happen as soon as possible. Um, those negative lab results may come in um, at a slower rate, um, and so we may see some pretty wide fluctuations in our testing positivity in the immediate future. Thank you. Kim. All right. All right. Th thank you. 
Okay, I believe the next outlet we have on the line is the Bakersfield, California, and I think Teddy was able to get in at the last minute. I am here. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I hope everyone has a great day. Great, thank you. We'll go on. Our next outlet is Kern Radio. I believe we have JR on the line. Yeah, JR Kern Radio. I have a question about the 80 nurses that were approved by the Board of Supervisors. You said some are currently here. How many of those 80 nurses are currently here right now as we speak working in local hospital? We'll have Matt respond. JR, good morning. Um, so the arrangement we have uh, allows uh, the hospitals to actually um, contract directly with the staffing company and obtain uh, the number that we have allocated up to that number that we've allocated and then utilize them. So they're coming in. Today I don't have a count for you, JR. I'm sure I can get you a number. It is increasing. It takes them a while to secure those nurses and to uh, ask them to move into Kern County for a while. So uh, it's starting. I just don't have an accurate number, but I can certainly get you more information if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. The next outlet we have on the line is Kern Soul. I believe we have Elizabeth. Hi, good morning, Megan. It's Elizabeth. Um, my question today is about the farm worker testing program. Um, I was just wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about how this program works. Is someone from public health going to the work site to do testing? Do farm workers sign up? And out of all of the tests that you've conducted, do you have a number yet on how many have tested positive? Okay, so I think I can probably take the first half of this. Um, so let me give you some details about the program. So we partnered with Good Samaritan Hospital to deliver this. They coordinate with the um, companies, the agriculture companies here in town who have employees who need to be tested and they do that on a rotation. Uh, they work with a schedule that's uh, convenient for the workers and depending on what they're doing on any one given day. So they, uh, they move through the various agriculture companies here in the county. Um, I think to date, I think we've tested 76. I don't believe we would have counts on how many of those are positive simply because that's a little bit too detailed to, uh, to identify um, and would probably hurt the privacy of those involved. Um, I'm checking with Matt to make sure. Yeah. Oh, so that I think that completes the full answer to your question, but if you have more, let me know. Um, just one follow-up. So the, the agriculture companies reach out to Good Samaritan or Samaritan reaches out to the ag companies and they schedule based off that? Is that how it works? I think it's a combination of all of that. Um, so we obviously have knowledge of some of the larger companies and their operations, so we can reach out to them. Also, those uh, other companies can reach out to us and let us know that they want us to come do the testing. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, our next outlet that we have on the line is Mojave Desert News. Okay, we'll go to the next one. I believe we have someone from Mountain Enterprise on the line. Yeah, if this is your first time on the call, because I think this is, uh, it's star six to unmute, and then we'll be able to hear you. Okay, we're gonna go on to the next one. If we need to, we can come back. Uh, our next outlet is Valley Public Radio. I believe we have Carrie on the line. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, well, I was wondering, I mean, as we grapple with these rising cases here in, in Kern County and elsewhere in the Valley, I mean, is there anything, well, basically, I mean, like, uh, obvi we obviously are addressing this every time that we have this call, but what do you think are the reasons <laughs> that, that, that the cases just keep rising so much? I mean, is there anything that you think that, the, that, that, that they are at the county that you could have done differently or that you would have done differently if you were to go back? I guess that's two questions. Yeah, Carrie, let me make sure I understand your question. There was, it was kind of a bit garbled. So what you're asking is 
Given the number of rising cases, is there anything that we can identify that's led to that and anything we should do differently? Am I catching that right? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I know, like, the, the short answer is, you know, we've had a lot of, like, person-to-person -person spread, but I guess, like, yeah, kind of overall, what what is the, yeah, I mean, how did we get here to this point despite all of these public health measures that we've taken? And then, yes, are there any things that the county would have done differently going back? Okay, thanks, Carrie. I think uh, we're trying to decide who's going to answer that one. It's going to be Kim. Give us one second. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Thank you. It's a really good and important question. Um, the, the short answer is that we always expected cases to rise. You know, if this is, um, if COVID-19 is a truly novel virus, then most of us are going to catch it. Um, we know, particularly in the very beginning of, um, you know, back in March when we started having our first cases in Kern County, that testing was, was very um, scaled back. Uh, it wasn't widely available. You had to meet very specific criteria in order to be tested. So we know that we were not catching all of the people at that time. As we've ex uh, expanded testing capacity in our community, um, we've enabled more and more people to be tested so they can um, know about their status, they can take precautions, we can um, trace around them. Um, and so I don't think it's a, it's a question of, of um, whether or not we ever expected to see more cases. We knew that we would continue to see it increase. Um, we're hopeful at any given point in time that we will see it stabilize and decrease again, um, but we know that transmission is expected to go on. We want people to continue to take every effort um, to maintain the precautions that have been spoken about since the very beginning. Keep your physical distancing. Um, you know, wash your hands, stay healthy as an individual person, um, stay home when you're sick, avoid people who are sick, do all of those things to minimize transmission in our community. Um, and so we do expect cases to continue to rise. We haven't seen it plateau here um, locally, um, but we want people to keep making those efforts and to keep doing everything they can to prevent transmission um, within their households, within their families, and throughout our entire community. Thank you, Kim. Okay, thanks. So, the, so then, no, so there's nothing about um, like whether. Well, so I guess you're saying that there there isn't anything you would have done differently. I I'm hearing that there's nothing new. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay, sure. Thanks. Okay, so our next outlet, I believe we had Norma from Telemundo join. Okay, and then there is also an unknown caller. If you belong to one of the outlets that we did not call, it's because we can't identify who you're with. Um, so if Hi, there's- Hi, can you guys hear me? We can now, go ahead. This is, okay, this is Aaron Roney with Channel 29. Sorry, I'm calling on my cell. So that's that's okay, that, I number. figured it was either you or 23. So go ahead, Aaron. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no worries, I apologize. So I do have a few questions, I will keep them short. Uh, we are seeing uh, an uptick in family spread. I'm just wondering if there's a known case where families are getting this. Um, something else is, do you feel that we are getting ahead of our backlog or is this something we are unsure of at the moment because of the, the because of Cal Ready, the lab results being delayed? And uh, since we aren't sending our lab results to Cal Ready, where else are we gonna be sending them? And my final question is how many healthcare workers have been impacted by COVID-19? Okay, so that was like three I know or that's four questions. <laughs> Uh, so let me see if I can summarize that in a way that makes it possible for our experts to answer succinctly. Uh, the first question was about family spread, whether or not we're seeing an uptick right. in that. The second question, shoot, I think I may have forgotten the second one. What was it? I'm sorry. No, I apologize. I know it's a lot. Um, just do you think we're getting ahead of, of our backlog testing or are we unsure because of the Cal Ready lab? Okay. And then your third and fourth question were about the number of healthcare workers that have been impacted? Yes, and then my third question was, is there a lab that you all are possibly thinking of using instead of CalReady? Okay, just making sure we keep track of these. Um, I think Kim's up to bat first and we'll try and make our way through these. Thank you. 
Um, so regarding the first question about family spread, we've known and we've seen since the very beginning lots of spread among um, close contacts, which includes families and households. Um, it is very common uh, for a first person to be identified in the household. For other people who are in close contact, um, often in a household, you eat meals together um, and you know, you're sharing bedrooms and things like that. And so we do see a lot of people who live together um, who become positive around the same um, point in time. The second question regarding um, the backlog of test results, um, we are unfortunately still seeing some test results that are coming back. Um, unfortunately, even two weeks after that specimen was collected, we know the labs have worked to increase the capacity and they are testing as many as they can as quickly as possible. Um, but we are still unfortunately seeing delays. If you are a patient um, and you are still waiting for your laboratory test results, please make sure that you're in contact with your healthcare provider or the community test site that tested you um, so that they can double check that they have not received that test result back. Um, we do know that we're seeing significant delays. We've tried to help patients um, as they work through this. Um, of, of what they can do while they're waiting for their test results. But unfortunately, that um, delay is still happening. Um, we are seeing a um, separate type of delay currently with the state database CalReady um, having disruption to electronic laboratory reporting. Um, and so even though some patients are hearing from their health care provider right away, um, they may not be hearing from us at the public health department um, because of this disruption and the delay because at the health department, um, we may not be receiving that test result for two or three days after the healthcare provider gets it. Um, some are coming back even later. And so we are encouraging our, our patients, if you are known to be positive, to reach out to us at the public health department to um, go online to fill out the case report form that we've put online to make it a little bit more convenient and a little bit more efficient um, for our community. Um, you can navigate it to it from the kernpublichealth.com webpage. Click on the green um, coronavirus um, button. There is a green button on the uh, COVID-19 web page that says positive patients click here. And then on that final page is a case report form that you as a positive patient can fill out at your convenience. It is both available in English and in Spanish. This will help us reach out to you quickly um, because we may still be waiting for your laboratory result to come into us. Um, we are working with the state. The state is working very hard to um, get the system back online and to fix the disruption that we're seeing. Um, but we know right now today that we are seeing significant delays in getting that reported to us at the public health department, which of course impacts our ability to contact um, any of our cases and follow up with any of the close contacts. Question number three. Uh, so the third question was about healthcare workers and the number of healthcare workers. So um, for healthcare workers that we don't have a um, a set number of healthcare workers where we are tracking. You can find out for our skilled nursing facilities how many positives they've had in skilled nursing facilities. The state puts that out publicly. We have not publicly released the number of healthcare workers who've been impacted in our community. And then, that was it, I think. I think. Um, just my last question was, um, since you guys are trying to avoid using Cal Ready, is there another lab you all are thinking of oh. directing result or tests to? So CalReady is not a laboratory. CalReady is the California Reportable Disease Information Exchange. It's the state database system that the local health um, the local health department uses to communicate with the state health department and vice versa. This is how we report all of our cases to them. A module in that system is electronic laboratory reporting. Um, so instead of the laboratories having to fax off each individual laboratory report um, to the local health departments, is it comes through basically an exchange process where they submit um, in in batch format and. Then those records, those laboratory reports get divvied out to the different counties um, of residents. That module right now with the electronic lab reporting system is down. Um, it's uh, dealing with some, some issues that they're working out at the state level. Um, we have asked that our local labs um, report directly to the public health department, um, anyone who was using that electronic system so that we can receive those results um, in a more timely fashion. Um, so we've been reaching out to those labs to ensure that we are still getting laboratory reports. But this, of course, you know, is a entire operational change for those labs who have been using this electronic format for many years. Um, so they are working through it. We are working through it. Everybody is working as hard as they can to make this communication as seamless as possible. Thanks. Thank you for explaining that. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Cam. You took the heavy lift on that one. 
Um, okay, so I think we've made it through all of our outlets that we have on the line. I'm going to open it up for any additional follow-up questions. Yeah, this is Mike Hart from 23ABC. Can you hear me? We can. Sorry we missed you. Yeah, that, that's all right. Um, I wanted to touch on quickly uh, a couple of things real briefly. Uh, Matt uh, had mentioned the ICU beds at 266, I believe he said today, and that was sort of at a critical capacity. Back on July 25th on the dashboard, it listed the number of ICUs or hospitalized at 301. Now, is that all hospital beds potentially, or are all that are COVID patients automatically put into ICU beds? So, Mike, I think there may be uh, some confusion around the numbers. Um, so we're, we're making sure we have clear numbers for you, and then we can reiterate that. So you need the total number of hospital beds and ICU beds? Well, no, Megan, I'm curious about if it's 266 today and we're at sort of like a critical level, it was 301 back on July 25th, and so we reduced by about 34 or 5. Uh, did we have more beds then? Are there less ICU beds now? Uh, I just was wondering about if 266 today is considered pretty bad. We had 301 uh, just two weeks ago. Okay, we're going to have Matt respond to your question, Mike. I think we're also pulling data really quickly, so just be patient with us. Sure. Uh, Mike, good morning. Um, so these are some confusing um, data points, and it changes all the time. So the state um, reports to us what the hospitals are reporting about how many COVID-positive hospitalizations there are and how many COVID-positive ICU uh, beds that are being used. So those numbers change uh, quite a bit every day, and you're right, uh, they did come down uh, somewhat. Um, there is a lag between when uh, the hospitals report to the state and when the hospitals report to us. Um, we ask that the hospitals provide us data every um, three days or Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, and then at times they may have more um, in ICU beds than they have licensed, so they go to their surge response. So those numbers vary and are, are dynamic. They're kind of managed individually by each hospital. So, Mike, I'm not quite sure I answered your complete question, and if I didn't, perhaps you could help me refine it or direct me otherwise. Uh, well, I was just curious when it says number of hospitalized people, like you said, it was 266. Is there a breakdown? I mean, are there people that are considered hospitalized and not sick enough for ICU, or if they're on that list, are they all considered ICU? So, Kim, are you, I think I'm going to defer to Kim to see if she could try to answer that. So hold on just one moment, and I think she's collecting data as we speak. And this, perhaps we could provide you a response later, I'm, I'm assuming. So, Mike, let's do that. Okay. Let us uh, get you a better, uh, more complete answer. Kim is trying to look up that information, and uh, we'll give it to well, Megan, and then she can send it out. If you could also, if you're to look, as long as you're looking up, I know I have another number, and you just mentioned how the state data is sort of in flux. Uh, the other question I had was, uh, as of today, we have 6109 recovered patients, 6109. Uh, back on July 1st, we had 3690. So that's an increase of about 2,400. Those isolating at home on July 1st went from 5,800 and changed over 15,100, a change of 9,300. So given that it's 34 days in that gap between July 1st and today, with the, the number of people isolating at home increasing by 9,300, but by recovering only down 2,400, I was wondering what is the criteria for moving off the isolation list and onto the recovered list? Does it require more testing that has to go get reported somewhere else and then get back at some future point? So Mike, I'm going to ask Kim to see if she can respond for you. Hi, Mike. So on our dashboard, um, what you see for people under that recovered column are those who have been released um, off of isolation. They've had isolation discontinued either at home or at in the healthcare facility. Um, we follow CDC's criteria um, for discontinuing isolation or transmission-based precautions um, in those settings. And so patients need to uh, be at least 10 days from their 
uh, symptom onset. They, it must be at least 24 hours since their fever has resolved, and they must have improved symptoms. Um, there are some rare instances where that is different. Um, that's the main criteria that is used. There are others that are available. Um, and once those patients are um, assessed and are able to be um, moved from the isolated at home or isolated in the hospital um, category into the recovered, no longer under isolation category, um, they, they do get moved. Um, we do know that we, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying that, that it's been 34 days since that, since July 1st. And with that, with uh, almost, oh, I can't even, I'm doing the math off the top of my head here. It's almost 7,000 uh, people that, uh, I'm just wondering if that number of recovered should be higher by now. Uh, it probably should be. Um, and so that's, that's part of us also going through making sure the data on the dashboard is correct. Um, we are also, mm -hmm. you know, we see a large influx of people and some of those people are not going to be done in 10 days. Some people are symptomatic much longer and so their um, time frame being isolated will extend because we do, our, we do look into those symptoms. Um, and so we are working to get that updated. You know, we are focusing most of our case investigation and contact tracing attention on reaching out to patients, getting them educated, making sure they understand what the process is and then we are going through and we are also making updates to our dashboard. So obviously those patients who were um, isolated at the beginning of the month um, or in the beginning of July, hopefully most of them um, have been released from isolation and we are making sure that that information is reflecting on our dashboard. So we are trying to um, reconcile those things obviously and, and make sure that all the information we have in one place makes it to another. Okay, and I apologize. I know that there's the confusion with the numbers right now coming from the state, but I'm just wondering if once we get all these backlog numbers put in, are they going to be put in on the date we get them? Are they going to be put back on the days that actually happened? And how will that impact the, how long the businesses and everyone else around here that we're on this monitoring list, will that extend the life of how long we're on that list? So the, the short answer is to where do all these patients fall in is everything on our COVID-19 dashboard is based on the specimen collection date. Um, so that's how we count cases because that is the earliest known date that a person was assessed and um, potentially um, infectious at that time. And so that's sort of the, the date that you see when we are counting cases. Um, when we are uh, releasing patients off of isolation, um, that number um, is effective the date that is put in. So if we find somebody who was released um, who who discontinued isolation yesterday and we enter that today, it will show up on yesterday's data as another person having been um, in that recovered category. So I'm going to let Matt answer the rest of it. So Mike, your question about businesses. Um, so the state's database failure um, will not affect our businesses now. Um, the governor has indicated that once you're on the monitoring list for three days, then the governor's new restrictions apply. And so that has occurred already. Uh, unfortunately, um, and unlike previously, um, the local success, our local success on meeting those metrics on the monitoring list no longer have relevance on allowing local businesses to open back up. The governor has indicated that once you're on the list as a county, you stay on the list. And the only way you come off is statewide. We do it as a state and not as a county. So those, those numbers, those, those um, numbers we're waiting for the, the, to come through the state database do not affect businesses today. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, thank you. Okay, I think we're on the uh, follow-up questions. Trying to make sure we keep on track. So do we have any other outlets with follow-up questions? Yeah, JR Kern Radio. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, follow-up for Mike's questions. Uh, Mr. Constantine had said something about only receiving data from the hospital every three days. I want to make sure I heard that right. And if so, why only Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Why not every day, uh, especially considering where we are with our hospital numbers? We'll have Matt respond. Uh, JR, good morning again. Um, so the state requires every acute care hospital to report daily uh, bed polls, a daily number of the amount of patients and available beds. The state then provides that to us. Um, we asked, uh, with the hospital CEO's concurrence, to collect additional data 
Um, we were doing it once a week, and it was somewhat repetitive from the state data, but we felt it was more meaningful for us. Uh, for example, the state was including uh, NICU's uh, bed counts uh, into their ICU count, which we didn't think was a true representation of what was available in Kern County. Um, so we went from actually one day a week to three days a week. So this is above and beyond what is normally done, um, and it, it far exceeds the state standards. But we felt it provided additional helpful information to us um, to do it. So it's a, it's, it's a lot more work uh, for the hospitals, but we find it more meaningful. JR, hopefully that answers your question. No, it did. Thank you very much for clarifying. Sure. Any other follow-up questions? Uh, it's Aton Wallace again with KGET uh, for a follow-up. Go ahead. And uh, I just want to make sure I heard Kim correctly, and I, I, I'm quoting here. To quote, she said, most of us are going to catch it. Uh, did I hear that correctly, and are you able to ex ex expand further? So I'm going to have Kim respond to her statements about what, what you may have heard. So we'll have Kim start. Thank you. Hi, Eitan. Um, thank you for clarifying. You know, with a, any novel virus, um, the general assumption is that um, the entire population is susceptible. And so we are all at risk of, of catching COVID-19. We want to minimize that, of course, and I'm very hopeful that many of us will not catch it um, if we continue to do the things that have been recommended. Um, so thank you for clarifying that. But when you talk about any kind of um, novel pathogen, um, what that basically means is if that means that nobody's immune to it, nobody's been exposed to it in the past um, and so that we are all at risk of, of coming in contact and being infected by the virus that causes COVID-19. Hey, much appreciated, Kim. Thank you for that. And, and just one more question, uh, uh, guys, just regarding state models. I know I've asked Mr. Constantine about this in the past. Um, I know he actually addressed this at the Board of Supervisors on Tuesday, but how accurate are, are the state models now? And, and, uh, and what's the Public Health Department doing with uh, the model data? Aton, it sounded like you got cut off there at the end. Did you just say, what are we doing with the model data? Did I hear that right? Yes, uh, thank okay. you, Megan. That's correct. Okay. We'll have Matt answer your question. <clears throat> um, so good morning. Um, so yes, the state provided model. Um, we are tracking along um, pretty closely to what was projected. And for months now, the model has indicated that ICU beds would be a concern for us towards the end of July. Um, and that, in fact, has uh, come true for us here locally. Now, the model shows that uh, we are not going to peak until likely into February. And really, the cases don't subside or the hospital admittance doesn't subside until late summer. Of course, it's just a model, and there's a lot of factors that can change it. We're actually optimistic that we can change it if we continue to do our actions and, and really do more to try to keep that disease uh, from being transmitted. Um, so it is surprisingly accurate so far, and we do look at it carefully, but it was a good indicator for us as to what we needed to do to prepare. Um, and I'm grateful that we've had a lot of these steps in place um, because we find ourselves today in, in, a, in a challenging situation. Does that answer your question? No, so, Matt, it does. Thank you. Uh, and, and in terms of August then, I mean, just in the, the following weeks, uh, does, does the model indicate, indicate anything in particular or is it just kind of going up? So just going up. It shows a slow and steady increase heading up into um, early 2021 where cases uh, will continue to rise. Our ICU hospitalizations will continue to rise. Um, and that, that's where our focus has been. It's those ICU beds and needing to do everything we can to um, allow them to remain open and uh, staffed and available uh, for anybody that needs them. Okay, Matt. Thanks so Thank much. You. Any other follow-up questions? Yeah, Jay, I'll return to Aaron you. Roney here with 29. Oh, go ahead. 
Yeah, just uh, on, on something that Matt just said uh, about changing the model in actions, and then he said more could be done. What more could we could be done? I know we're not enforcing the rules here as gyms and hair salons and kids sports centers continue to stay open in defiance of the governor's order. Is what's more action? Jerry, we're gonna have Matt respond. Uh, JR, so you're right. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that we can influence that um, graph and the number of cases in our, in our hospital. Um, so the first thing is um, what we are doing uh, when we get complaints or are aware of an activity, meaning a gathering or a business that's operating, um, we track that information, we collect it at our call center, and uh, we will send out uh, a letter asking the business to uh, review the um, guidance documents and to ensure compliance. If that's unsuccessful, uh, we send a second letter um, reiterating the need to take action. If that is unsuccessful, um, we refer it to the state's strike team uh, where they have the ability to enforce the governor's order. And so those activities are ongoing. Um, I think as a community, um, we need to uh, do more. Um, what the ICU beds are telling us is we're running short. And as Dr. Lyon has said and as Kim has said, um, we need to remember that this disease is here. It presents a risk to us. I know it's hard to keep up the, the work and the effort, but unless we do that, um, and what the curve is showing us is we will have more ICU uh, cases than we do beds and nurses. We don't want to be in that position. So uh, of all the activities we've talked about of not going to gatherings and even though you want to see family and share a meal, you know, you, we don't want to do that. We want to do everything we can to keep that curve down, to continue the work. Let's not lose the progress, but we got, we have more work to do. We have more heavy lifting to do. Um, and we know what we need to do, but we just can't forget about the importance. Um, so, JR, I think that's what my comment was in relation to. Hey, I think we also had Aaron uh, from Channel 29 looking to do a follow-up. Did I hear that correctly? Hi, thank you so much. Um, so, just my last question is, uh, we did see that uh, there's that Dignity protest yesterday. I'm just wondering if anybody has a response to that. And also, is that what prompted the new order of 22 pallets of PPE to those local hospitals, or was this something that was already in the works before this protest happened? So, Erin, I'm not sure I understood that correctly. Are you, you, can you say that again? Sorry. Let me just ask you to read. Yeah, of course. Question. Yeah, so um, we did see that new order of 22 pallets of PPE. Um, I'm just wondering, was that in response to the Dignity protest yesterday, or was this something that was ordered and placed before the protest happened, and if anyone does have a response to the Dignity protest that took place yesterday? Yeah, they're unconnected, and I'm sorry we had to ask you to clarify. We just needed to understand better if that order was placed before that time. No worries. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. If there are no further follow-ups, we're going to go ahead and close. I want to thank our partners from the media. I know this is very complex information, and we're trying to give you live at your fingertips uh, data and responses. So thank you for being patient with us as we figure this out. I also want to thank Stephanie, our ALS interpreter. She's been here by herself today, and we've definitely made it challenging for her. So thank you, Stephanie, and we will see you next week. Thank you. All right, you've just been listening to our public health department give an update on the coronavirus crisis here in Kern County. And uh, once again, 291 cases announced today. That brings our total to 21,724. Uh, we have 266 hospitalizations. Again, they're reiterating the fact that there is a, a an issue with the uh, uh, testing reporting or the reporting of positive results uh, from the state level. And that is one of the reasons why we could be seeing 
a decrease in daily cases being announced. So uh, they're wanting to reiterate that message that there that is one of the reasons why we could be seeing uh, a small amount of cases being announced every single day. Uh, however, once again, our hospitalization rate continues to, uh, to increase with 266 hospitalizations. Uh, one of the things that they did talk about was the, the Kern County Federal Testing Site um, that is located at the fairgrounds. Uh, it is open seven days a week from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. Anyone can go and get a test uh, for free. And uh, Megan Pearson, the county uh, chief uh, communication officer, talked about that that is a good site to utilize if you are an asymptomatic person, if you want to just go and get tested uh, and not showing any symptoms. So uh, they encourage anyone to utilize that uh, facility, but especially people who um, want to just get tested and they're not showing any symptoms. Uh, they also talked about, uh, you heard from Kimberly Hernandez, the lead epi epidemiologist for the Kern County Public Health Department, talk about uh, how with any novel virus, uh, it is under the assumption that most people will get it. And that is why they're once again stressing the importance of social distancing, wearing a mask, and trying to limit the spread of this virus as uh, you know, we continue to deal with all of these obstacles, especially uh, with our hospitals and the concern that they could be reaching capacity in the coming days, weeks, and months. Uh, they also talked about the state monitoring list. As you know, Kern County has been on the state monitoring list for several weeks now. The only the only way, the only way the county gets off that list, according to our local health officials, is if the whole entire state is taken off that list. Uh, they reiterated that once a county is put on that list, it will take the rest of the state uh, the numbers to go down considerably for everyone to be removed from that list. So it looks like we could be uh, with those restrictions for several more weeks, if not months, depending on how California is doing in regards to limiting the spread of coronavirus. Uh, one of the other things that they talked about was the state model, and we have talked about this on 17 News for several weeks now, and the models project uh, a grim August. Uh, it projects our death toll to continue to spike. Uh, it continues to show that hospitalizations are going to increase as well. And you heard from Director of uh, the uh, uh, Kern County Public Health Department talk about how the models have been surprisingly accurate so far predicting that we were going to see uh, uh, near surge capacity or, or capacity with our ICU beds. And he says, so far we have been pretty much following what the models predicted. That is definitely concerning, considering that we could see a very uh, grim month in regards to the amount of people that could lose their lives uh, to coronavirus this month alone. He wanted to reiterate, though, that there is uh, the models are only as good as the numbers that come in. And if people continue to practice those measures of social distancing and wearing a mask, that could make the models scale back a little bit, meaning that we could help. Uh, limit this spread. So that is definitely some good news as well. We are going to have more news coming up today on 17 News at noon. For now, I'm Alex Fisher. We'll see you back at noon.